am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. My name is Robert Benham. I'm a retired judge and lawyer whose professional career was spent in Memphis, Tennessee. The purpose of this course was to expose people of all ages to the civil rights movement in the South that existed between the years 1955, ending with the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. By the summer of 1961, there were debates among the organizations in what I generally referred to as the movement as to their direction. It was, do we continue sit-ins and desegregation of public facilities versus voter registration? In other words, voting versus marching. Registering versus riding buses and thus entering into the mainstream of the political process. Funds were being made available to John Lewis organization, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee from many well-known people, including Harry Belafonte, who raised a great deal of money for him. And as an aside, Ann and I were fortunate enough uh, to hear Harry Belafonte in Memphis at a Hooks Institute event. And though his voice was raspy at best, he stood in front of a huge crowd for over an hour with no notes, carefully dissecting the whole voting integration movement. Just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant presentation. In 1961, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was still based in Nashville, but they were on the road to moving their headquarters to, Na to uh, Atlanta. And at that point in time in the previous year, there had been a whole lot of media attention in Tennessee and elsewhere centered around Fayette and Hardeman counties in West Tennessee. Shelby County, where Memphis is, is right here on the state line. Fayette, Haywood County, Hardeman County, vast agricultural communities. And many people in those counties decided that they wanted to register to vote. And as thanks for their efforts, the landlords had them evicted from where they had farmed for years, if not for generations. They were then forced into tent cities, and I was privileged to have a lot of direct knowledge of the ensuing litigation. In fact, it was almost on a daily basis because one of my very good friends from both high school, college, and law school was a son-in-law of one Lucius Birch, a Memphis lawyer who decided to represent these people on a pro bono basis. Mr. Birch, as I always referred to him, was a white lawyer, originally from a most prominent family in Nashville. His father had been dean of the Vanderbilt Medical School. They had a huge estate out near uh, Andrew Jackson's Hermitage. For some reason, he chose to move to Memphis and join an uncle's firm. He was as good a trial lawyer as you'll find any place, and we'll hear more about him in two weeks because he was the number one lawyer representing Martin Luther King at, during the litigation in Memphis. Now, implications from the exodus of farm workers or sharecroppers and similar actions taken in Mississippi and Arkansas had a great effect on the economy of Memphis in the 1960s and are still being felt today. These workers, for all practical purposes, were 100% black, poorly educated, and had for decades following the Civil War farmed, had what they called no need for education and were ill-suited for anything else. Without land on which to farm and with no means to feed or clothe themselves, they moved by the thousands to metropolitan areas, mainly Memphis, where social services were extended to their basic needs. Why Memphis? Geographically, let's take a look. Memphis is right here. These are vast farming regions throughout Mississippi, Arkansas, and even what they call the boot heel of Missouri. Generally, 
Memphis, as we see it again, was the center, 220 miles southwest of Nashville, 140 miles east of Little Rock, 200 miles north of Jackson, Mississippi, and a little over 300 miles south of St. Louis. Largely agricultural with cotton, rice, and soybeans being the main cash crop. Now the publicity emanating from West Tennessee spurred a great deal of interest in black voter registration throughout organizations that were mobilizing for the then growing civil rights movement. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee divided itself into two wings, a direct action wing and a voter registration wing. The voter registration wing planned to send what was known as field workers, or field secretaries, I should say, into areas throughout the South to set up offices and prepare for a targeted volunteer group of what they hoped would be 200,000 who would encourage voter registration. The persons in charge were Bob Moses, in this photograph, a Harlem native with a graduate degree from Harvard. And to balance this out, and I use the word balance for lack of a better verbiage, in order to get black people to identify with the leadership of this movement, you needed a native black, not a New Yorker. And this was the person who was the partner with Bob Moses, a man by the name of Amzie Moore, a service station operator from Cleveland, Mississippi, who with his partner undertook this huge voter registration drive. And again, we have these markers throughout the South today. This one reads, Amzie Moore, a local civil rights leader, built this house in 1941. An Army veteran, Moore also worked for the U.S. Postal Service. After returning from World War II, Moore dedicated himself to the civil rights movement, co-founding the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. His home served as a meeting place for many in the civil rights movement, including Bob Moses, Sam Block, Aaron Henry, Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, Andrew Young, John Lewis, and Thurgood Marshall. Their efforts started in Cleveland, Mississippi, and Cleveland, Mississippi is right here. And this is the heart of what's known as the Delta. Cleveland was really not that far from Money, Mississippi, the site of the uh, Emmett Till abduction and killing. Money would have been right about here. Why was this area targeted? 90% of the black families lived below the poverty level. The average annual income of a black was less than $1,500. 7% of black students finished high school as opposed to 42% of white students, which means that 58% of white students didn't even finish high school. And these are the people today in current legislation uh, these are parents who are being asked to determine what curriculum is to be taught in schools. Um, huge black population. 5% of the eligible black voters were registered. In many counties, it was zero. Violence associated with attempts of blacks to register continued unabated. As an example, and this is but one example out of many, occurred in September of 1961 near Macomb, Mississippi. This is a current map is located south Mississippi. This is the Louisiana line. And the area we're going to talk about is a little town called Liberty. One Herbert Lee, who was recruited by Bob Moses to register voters in that area, was shot dead by E.H. Hurst, a member of the Mississippi legislature. And on the very day of the shooting, the very day of the shooting, a coroner's jury was convened and ruled it was self-defense. I mean, that very day. Now, the relationship between Hearst and Lee is, is, I thought, extremely interesting. They had known each other since childhood. They both lived in a rural area. Hearst had really assisted Lee in the establishment of his business. They were not just casual acquaintances, they were good acquaintances. 
But just as soon as Lee tried to register black voters, the line was crossed in broad daylight in front of witnesses. Hearst got his gun out, shot him dead. Lewis Allen, a witness whose life was threatened, failed to testify as to the fact, and a protest resulted in beatings of the marchers and 119 arrests. Some years later, Allen was prepared to come forward in a federal civil rights investigation and testify as to what he actually saw. Allen, who had a business in Liberty, was effectively run out of town in that he could no longer operate his business. He was preparing to move, and the day before he was to leave, he was shot dead. Six, 60 Minutes did a documentary on this years later. The whole investigation stank from the word go. Initially, the FBI was called in by the Justice Department that was investigating the civil rights violation that led to the death of Herbert Lee. Justice, U.S. Justice, referred the Allen investigation to the sheriff of Ameek County. That sounds good. Well. According to the 60-minute documentary presented by Steve Croft, the main suspect in the Allen death was none other than the sheriff himself. The sheriff's father had been a higher-up in the Ku Klux Klan, and the sheriff himself was suspected of being a KKK member. And that was not unusual. The Klan effectively elected many local officials in the South to their local offices. And growing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Klan was a big political force with which to be reckoned. And their endorsements caused a lot of people to be elected or not to be elected. I was surrounded by it uh, throughout my childhood and until I went to college, frankly. By January of 62, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other organizations united to form the Council of Federated Organizations, it was called COFO, to unify the voter registration drive. Volunteers fanned out soliciting residents to register. Often this was done by working beside them in cotton fields, by living with them in their houses, by praying with them in their churches, and this was a whole new experience both for the volunteers as well as the would-be voters. And as I might add, this was dangerous. A prominent example of the recruitment effort was a 44-year-old sharecropper in Sunflower County named Fannie Lou Hamer, and we heard about her from Georgia last week. Ms. Hamer, to me, is a true example of courage. She was the youngest of only 20 children. And while her husband sharecropped on the Marlowe Plantation, she secured the job of timekeeper because she could read and write. She and her husband had no children, and the reason you're gonna hear in a minute, but adopted two daughters, and there they are in this picture. Fanny Lou Hamer, her husband, the two adopted daughters. I guess these children are about five or six. So about six years previously, uh, she was in North Sunflower County Hospital for minor surgery. She was, without her knowledge or consent, given a hysterectomy, then such a common procedure that it was known as a Mississippi appendectomy. <laughs> While attempting to register a busload of voters who were traveling from Ruleville to Indianola, and that was the route I showed you on an earlier slide, the bus on which they were traveling was stopped by the local police and the driver arrested. The charge was, quote, and this is from the charging documents, the bus was too yellow, end quote. <laughs> Ms. Hamer and 16 others were transported back to Ruleville and told to go back to where they came from. The owner of the plantation on which she was living heard about this and her other efforts, demanded this action ceased, and when she refused, her family was evicted and their vehicle and house furnishings confiscated by the landlord. But, but, she continued and was a force at the Democratic National Convention in 1964, requesting that the Mississippi Freedom Party be seated at that convention. And this is just some of her testimony. I've got to read just a portion of it 
My name is Fannie Lou Hamer, and I live at 626 East Lafayette, Ruleville, Mississippi, Sunflower County, the home of Senators James O. Eastland and John Stennis. It was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register and to try to become first class citizens. We was met in Indianola by Mississippi men, highway patrolmen, and they only allowed two of us in to take the literacy test at the time. After we had taken this test, they started back to Ruval, and we was held up by the city police and the state highway patrolman and carried back to Indianola, where the bus driver was charged that day with driving a bus the wrong color. And after we paid the fine among us, we continued on to Ruville. The Reverend Jeff Sonny carried me four miles in the rural area where I had worked as a timekeeper and sharecropper for 18 years. I was met there by my children who told me that the plantation owner was angry because I had gone down to try to register. After they told me, my husband came and said that the plantation owner was raising cane because I had tried to register, and before he quit talking, the plantation owner came and said, Fannie Lou, you know, did Pat tell you what I said? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I mean that. If you don't go down and withdraw your registration, you'll have to leave. Then if you go down and withdraw, he said, you might have to go because we are not ready for that in Mississippi. And I addressed him and told him and said, I didn't try to register for you, I tried to register for myself. And I had to leave that same night. Later on, she was on a Continental Trailsway bus that went to help register people in Winona, Mississippi. And just, and, and, and I'm leaving out part of her testimony, but I think this just tells you where we were at that point in time in I'm not going to even call it a justice system. Uh, that's a misnomer. I got back on the bus, and one of the persons who had used the washroom got back on the bus, too. As soon as I was seated, I saw when they began to get the four people in a highway patrolman's car. I stepped off the bus to see what was happening, and somebody screamed from the car that the four workers was in and said, quote, get that one there, end quote. And when I went to get in the car, when a man told me I was under arrest, he kicked me. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to place us in cells. I was placed in a cell with a young woman called Miss Uvester Simpson. After I was placed in the cell, I began to hear the sound of kicks and horrible screams. And I could hear somebody say, quote, can you say yes, sir, nigger, end quote. Can you say yes, sir, end quote. And they would say with horrible names. She would cry, quote, yes, I can say yes, sir, end quote. Quote, so say it, end quote. She says, quote, I don't know you well enough. <laughs> they beat her. I don't know how long. And after a while, she began to pray and ask God to have mercy on these people. I was carried out of that cell into another cell where they had two Negro prisoners. The state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro to take the blackjack. The first Negro prisoner ordered me, by uh, orders from the state highway patrolman for me, to lie down on a bunk bed on my face, and I laid on my face. The first Negro began to beat, and I was beat by the first Negro until he was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I was holding my hands behind me at the time on my left side because I suffered from polio when I was six years old. After the first Negro had beat until he was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. The second Negro began to beat, and I began to work my feet, and the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro who had beat to sit on my feet to keep me from working my feet. And I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me by my head and told me to hush. One white man, my dress had worked up high, he walked over and pulled my dress down and he pulled my dress back up. I was in jail. 
then all of this is on account we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America, is this America the land of the free and the home of the brave where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Thank you, Fannie Lou Hamer. In Mississippi, they formed, you had the Democratic Party, and then you had another Democratic delegation, primarily of black people who had organized and gone to the convention. And they wanted, there was a question as to who was to be seated at the convention. The request to the Credentials Committee and this is Ms. Hamer at the convention, and again, the obligatory remembrance of her. And finally, the Democratic Party, in a conciliatory gesture, offered them two at-large seats. Hubert Humphrey made it clear that neither of these two seats would go to Hamer, and in a direct quote, Humphrey stated, quote, the president has said he will not let that illiterate woman speak on the floor of the Democratic Convention, end quote. Oh. Now, let's reflect back to that convention and what was going on. This was the race between Johnson and Goldwater. Johnson had championed a lot of the rights of black people with legislation that probably nobody else could have gotten through Congress. <coughs> But he was in an election fight, and he was of the opinion that he could lose approximately 15 states because of the position he had taken in adopting the Civil Rights Act. Even though he championed black people on the one hand, when there was somebody like Fannie Lou Hamer who was really voicing what was happening on the ground to black people, he didn't want this to be heard. He just didn't want it to be heard. I don't really have a logical explanation for it, but that was the position in which they were in. The Solid South was as democratic as it is Republican today. Oh. Again, growing up, very few people voted in the general election. Everybody voted in the Democratic primary because that was the election. There was no point in going to the uh, general election because there were never any Republican candidates. Now, backing up to 1962, while the cause was the same methodology was in question, newer members such as Stokely Carmichael were advancing the self-defense argument. Older members adhered to the original statement of purpose as printed in the organization's handbook and read in part, quote, we affirm the philosophical or religious ideal of nonviolence as the foundation of our purpose and presupposition of our faith and the manner of our action. Nonviolence, as it grows from the Judaic tr Christian tradition, seeks a social order of justice permeated by love, Integration of human endeavor represents the crucial first step towards such a society. Through nonviolence, courage displaces fear, love transforms hate, acceptance dissipates prejudice, hope ends despair. Peace dominates war, faith reconciles doubts, mutual regard cancels enmity. Justice for all overthrows injustice." End quote. Now, by the fall of 1963, progress was made in voter registration. A freedom vote was scheduled in Mississippi, and this was just a vote to determine how many blacks could be depended on in future elections, and 90,000 black Mississippians voted in this simulated election to demonstrate their influence. An army of whites was recruited for the continuation of the vote, and volunteers poured in from Stanford, Berkeley, Swarthmore, Harvard, Mount Holyoke, and Bryn Mawr, to name but a few schools. These volunteers had to pay their own way and even had to pledge a $500 bond in the event of arrest. 
the quote, good people, end quote, and this is one of the voter rallies, of Mississippi were less than thrilled. Paul Johnson, the governor, doubled the number of highway patrolmen on duty that summer, and Alan Thompson, the mayor of Jackson, caused the city to purchase 200 new shotguns, troop carriers, searchlight trucks, and even a tank on which was mounted a machine gun. And this was one of his anti-protest vehicles. Not to be outdone, the Klan in a unified display of strength on one night burned crosses in 64 of Mississippi's 82 counties. Headquarters for the movement was set up in Greenwood, and of course there was white outrage in that community. The New York Times, and this is a direct quote, quoted one Greenwood native as say, saying, quote, we killed two-month-old Indian babies to take this country, and now they want us to give it away to the niggers, end quote. This was in the New York Times. Why don't we take a little break now? This is a, a good time for it, and then we'll get more into the Freedom Riders and into the schools.